Good evening, I'm Ruth Richardson, CEO of Wayside Recovery Center. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our annual empowerment event. We're sad that we're unable to do this in person this year, but we know that you'll leave tonight inspired. 66 years ago, our organization was born out of the sheer will and determination of one phenomenal woman, Sally DeVay. Sally was a door-to-door -door salesperson of cosmetics. And what she described in her door-to-door -door sales were her encounters with women who were struggling. She encountered women who were struggling with homelessness, women who had experienced abuse and domestic violence. What she described was women who had been left by the wayside. While Sally saw a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges, Sally also saw an opportunity for a pathway for hope. She saw a future for those women that could be better than what they were experiencing within that moment. Out of that hope and out of that sheer determination, 66 years ago, Wayside was founded as a shelter. That first year, we served just seven women. Fast forward to today, we serve more than 700 women each year and over 350 children. Wayside Recovery Center provides gender-specific services. This includes inpatient residential services for women with substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health issues. We're also one of the first in the nation and one of the first in the state to provide family treatment. Programs that would allow moms to come along with their little ones into inpatient residential programs in order to get started on their recovery journey. Families do better when they're able to stay united and our family treatment program is a testament to that fact. We also provide outpatient services, including substance use disorder and mental health uh, uh, counseling services. And one of the programs that we're very proud of as well is our supportive housing program. Our supportive pro housing program is a permanent program where moms can come with their little ones and stay as long as they need in order to get secure in their sobriety, secure in their recovery journey, and also secure financially as well. 66 years has been an amazing legacy for Wayside Recovery Center. And those 66 years, we've served over 30,000 women and over 6,000 children. Tonight, we are coming to you with another message of hope. 2020 has been a difficult year for many. Being in a global pandemic, what we are seeing are that our needs are higher than they have ever been. There's increased need for substance use disorder treatment services, both inpatient and outpatient. There's a tremendous need for housing. Mental health issues are also rising as well. Now, more than ever, we need you and your support. But in the midst of everything that's incurring, we have not lost fact of the we have not lost sight of the fact that recovery is possible and we always have that continued hope that tomorrow can be better than what people are experiencing today. Tonight, I welcome you to hear an amazing story of hope, an amazing story of recovery. I am so excited to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Tanir Kane, and I look forward to closing out uh, from the program a little later tonight. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me to, to um, give my story of hope. Um, and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing and um, definitely for um, providing services for those um that just need someone to to help them to um to to get it to get on track you know um my presentation is a story of hope it's not a it's not anything clinical it's it just talks about what it took for me to be the person i am to today to be the heal successful individual i am today and um and it takes people and organizations such as Waysides to make sure that opportunities are there for us to heal, to get better. And I am very grateful that um, your organization is, is helping your needs, your needs. And so this presentation is my story. 
Um, and I have to take you back to my childhood and bring you up to speed of where I'm at today and what it took for me to become the healed, successful individual I am today um, after so much trauma, so much pain, so much suffering. And it's not an attempt to attack anybody in their profession. It's just about bringing awareness and what it takes for an individual to heal from their trauma. And so I am, um, I'm very grateful, you know, at very early on, at age nine, I, I, you know, I just I had a, a belief system that I am nothing. I never amount to anything. And, and it started very early on for me from when my trauma started. And so after, as you hear this presentation, you know, um, please be aware that you may be triggered in some ways. And um, if you're a trauma survivor, but I'm very grateful that um, I'm invited to tell my story. And I just want to say thank you for allowing me to come into your space and place to talk about my story of hope. Age, around age nine, I had created a belief system that I am nothing, I'll never amount to anything. And this is just how it's gonna be for me. This is a picture of me around age nine. Um, I remember getting ready for this photograph. I remember trying to make a straight part to make these perfect ponytails, right? Um, washing out that red and white connected polyester shirt with a, a bar Irish soap after picking it up off a pile of dirty clothes that we also use for toilet paper at times and brushing my teeth. I brush my teeth a lot, not because my mother said brush in the morning after every meal or at night, or because she would take us to the dentist regularly. She's never taken us to the dentist. I brush my teeth a lot because I thought if only I could brush away the smell of the men that used to force themselves in around my face, in my mouth or whatever. If only I could brush the smell away. See, no matter how much I wash my face and even brush my teeth, just at times the smell never seemed to go away. So I would brush and brush and brush and brush. I also started drinking alcohol around age nine, around around the time that the molestation started. I um I used to go into the living room after what we called those last night's party. And I would find these half-filled cups sitting around, still sitting around filled with alcohol, just alcohol they didn't finish. And I would just drink as many half-filled cups as I possibly could for me. Finding these half-filled cups helped me to deal with if my mother smacked me down and called me names, and if the men came at night, it would help me. So when someone came to me around age 19 and said, try this, it was crack cocaine. It was the answer to all of my problems. See, you know that smell that I talk about that it wouldn't go away? When I did this drug, that smell went away. But there was also a movie going on in my mind. You know, a movie that kept playing over and over again. The movie of the big man that covered my child's body and while he was hurting me, he had his elbow up against my mouth so I wouldn't scream. That movie wouldn't stop playing in my mind for years. But when I did this drug, that movie stopped playing. So yes, I ended up with a criminal record of 83 arrests and 66 convictions. They told me I was going to spend the rest of my life going in and out of prison or I was going to die in the streets. When I would leave a facility, it said, see you when you come back, Kane. And when I came back, I always came back. They said, welcome home. You want your old cell? You want your old rubber room? No one ever said, well, I really hope you give yourself a break. I know it's in you. I know you can do it. So this first 28 day program, I felt like there were a glimmer of hope because when I arrived there, the people seemed like they were upbeat and they were positive and I got excited because I'm like, if they, if you can help them, you can possibly help me. So they told me I had to see the intake worker, right? And very early on, very early on, I didn't feel safe, but I went to see this intake worker because this is what she did to make me feel so unsafe. She pulled out my file and she she did this. Miss Kane, have you ever been a victim of domestic violence? I said, 
lady, every man I had went upside my head and she just checked the box. And then she said, Miss Kane, have you ever been a victim of sexual abuse? I said, lady, I've been beat and raped so many times. I stopped counting them. She stapled this one page intake form inside my folder, folded away, never to be seen again. After I told this woman all the trauma I experienced up until this point of my life, I was assigned a male counselor. As a result of rapes or prostitution, my children were being conceived. My oldest was taken by my ex-husband that I spoke about. He took them away from me as a form of punishment and he sent them out of state. And then I had three other while I was in the streets and they, I never knew it was those three children. Father was my rapist or my trick, you know, when I used to prostitute, but they were mine. But rightfully so, they were taken away from me. Rightfully so, I couldn't take care of them. But I would try to go visit my children. And, you know, I was homeless at the time. I was filthy and, you know, but I will always try to go visit them. And I went this one particular time and I went to the Department of Social Services and I said, I'd like to see my kids. And the social worker told me, she said, Ms. Kane, um, we petitioned for adoption, um, the courts for adoption, and it was granted. You lost parental rights and we found a family for your children. And I said, well, can I see them one last time? And she said, you know what? I'll let you see them one last time. See, I, all I kept thinking was if I had an opportunity to hold them one last time and maybe just hold them close enough that their heart can be, can be matched to mine, even though I couldn't show them how much I love them, maybe somehow, some way they can feel my love. And if I have the opportunity this one last time to whisper in their little ears, I'm so sorry, please forgive me one day. So she told me when I can come back and visit. I got to the Department of Social Services and they put me in a room and the light came up on the other side of a one-way mirror. Yeah, they let me see my kids, but my kids couldn't see me. They allowed me to watch my children interact and play with their new mom, their adopted mom. When I went to walk out even more broken, she put this picture in my hand. She said, Miss Kane, this is a close adoption. Do not contact us again. So where do you go from there? I went deeper in the streets. Sixteen years ago, I'm in prison again. And I'm terrified. I'm about to lose another baby yet again. Because I knew if I'd never been successful in anything in my life, this time I would be successful in killing myself. I knew that. So I just I tried something that I really never tried sincerely before. I laid on that concrete floor in my prison cell and I cried out to God. I say, God, I don't know if you listen to people like me, but if you do, please help me. And it was an eerie, desperate, sincere cry. And I cried for hours, it seemed like it. And not long after that eerie, desperate cry to God, I found out about a program that they said, it helps you with your trauma. I'm like, well, I got everything else. I figured I got that too. I really didn't understand what trauma was, but they started to tell me that trauma was when I, all the times I was sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, you know, having my children take away from me, all those things not supposed to happen to you. I'm like, really? Because where I come from, that's not trauma. That happens to everybody. That's the norm. And they, they told me they would help me with my addiction and um, then I'll be able to recover. Do I really think these people can help me after so many failed treatments? No, not really. But they said something that nobody else said. They said, you get to keep your baby with you. And I was thinking, if only I can hold on to this one for more than three hours. See, my last daughter, I only had her for three hours before they removed her from my care. And I got to this program. Somebody greeted me at the door and said, I'm so glad you're here. After 19 years of living the, this, in distress and people telling me that I would never get better and treat me like I would never get better. 
people shaking their head in disgust. I couldn't even use people's bathroom. After 19 years of that, going out of the systems of care, being overly medicated and homeless on the streets, somebody was seen to be glad to see me. And I remember when I met with my Pacific trauma therapist, she said, you know, Tanira, everything that happened to you as a child happened to you, you didn't do to yourself. And I'm like, I never heard anybody say that. And she said it in such a, a, a compassionate way. She, she, it wasn't judgmental or anything. So I was able to believe her. She said, we're going to first start with the trauma that impacted your life. That's the issue with my mother, the neglect and the abandonment, right? And after, you know, after talking about and crying about in some sessions, I came to the realization one day, hold up. My mother lack of love for me is who she is. It doesn't define my character. So I was able to begin healing in that area. Then I went to one session and she said, now we're going to talk about all the times um, you were sexually, mentally, and physically abused. I'm like, uh, what lady? Because I've been beat and raped so many times. I stopped counting them. I can't even remember all the times. She said, let's talk about the times you can remember. And see, now I was in a safe environment. These things are no longer happening to me. And I was believed. And I was, I was able to begin healing in that area. Then she came to me and she said, now we're going to talk about your children, Tonya. And I say, no. How do you expect me to heal from something that continues to give me pain? Every day that I wake up, I realize I have four kids walking this earth. If I pass them in the streets, I wouldn't even know it. How do you heal from that? She said, you do. You just don't do it by yourself. And when I would talk about my kids, I would, I would just cross my arms. I would cry and I would rock and I would cry and I would rock. When I rock, she rocked. She would mask my emotions and she followed my lead. And she took me to a grieving process for four kids at the same time. So I was able to begin healing in that area. See, people over the 19 years try to give me bits and pieces of information, you know, but it will only get surfaced. Has so much trauma, so much pain packed so tightly, the bits and pieces of information I was getting couldn't penetrate any of that to get it rooted so I can build the foundation so my belief system can change from I am nothing to I am somebody and I can be anything I want in this world. See, it was when my belief system changed that my thought process changed. And I started to make the best decisions in my life. And the best decision I ever made in my life was to go through a one-year course and guess what? How to be a mother. Yes, because if you don't know, you just don't know. My learned experiences was from my mother. It was from my mother. I, I didn't know how to be loving and nurturing and protecting because I didn't receive it. So I had to go through a one-year course and learn how to match my daughter's, match my daughter's emotion and follow her lead so I can keep her feeling safe on the top path. And when I seen this picture right here, I knew that things were uh, had changed and um, that I could move forward. You know, I'm so grateful that I had the program I am at what I had because you know they did not assume they did not assume that because I was an adult that I knew how to be um, a homemaker or that I would because I was a mother and had given birth to all these other kids before that I would know how to be a mommy. I'm so glad they didn't assume that. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to do the circle security, get to um, the form of secure attachment. And when I moved out uh, to get my first apartment with my daughter, they understood this. This is what they understood. Before she got to us, she had been in and out of prison and in the streets homeless for 19 years. Before then she was married to an older man. She didn't have a job. You know, she left high school. She didn't have jobs, she didn't have edu education, so she wasn't paying bills. And before then, what? She, I was with an irresponsible mother that never paid bills that we got evicted everywhere as we get. So where would I learn responsibilities? Where would I then have that learned behavior? I didn't. And I'm glad they didn't assume. And because of this, with, within 18 months of leaving prison, I was able to build my own home at the time. And because somebody showed me how to 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 budget and do things like that and um i started my i was able to start my own company 
Uh, my daughter, this is, you know, we talk about trauma. We think about trauma as helping somebody right now, right? But the big picture of this is it breaks generational cycles for our children. And we, there's a different path that we have now on. You know what I mean? Because statistically, me having been pregnant with her in prison, she would have been in a system and so on and so forth. She would have ended up in the systems as well. Um, so, but no, because my trauma is treated, it, we, it broke that generational cycle. And we look at a whole different generational path from here on out. So what if at age nine, somebody recognized my trauma and I was able to embrace trauma treatment like I did 16 years ago? Isn't it possible that this child could become this woman? Can we actually look at someone like that or look at ourselves and truly believe? All I know is no one has the right to deem somebody hopeless, you know? When I started to feel safe, I started to heal. When I started to heal, I felt empowered. I had the chance to see my strength, not so much my weaknesses. And I started to feel worthwhile. And when I could see that progress, I was motivated to be who I am today, you know? All I know is that this is my belief. Nobody can change my mind. We are, the, we are created in the image of the almighty God. We are worth saving. We are worth saving. So remember, where there's breath, there's hope. Treat the trauma. You will get dif different results, you know? or receive the trauma treatment, you know? Just know that no matter what, as long as there's breath, there's hope. Thank you again for having me. Um, God bless each and every one of you. And thank you for the work that you're doing Wayside. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm um, love to you and those that you serve. Welcome back and thank you again for joining us tonight and a big thank you to Tony or Kane for sharing her story with us tonight. We are grateful for you re sharing your recovery journey with us. Stories are powerful and Tony proved that tonight. Indeed, it was the very stories that Sally DeVay heard all of those years ago that inspired her to found Wayside. But it was not only the powerful stories that she heard that inspired her, it was also the hope of what was possible that was an inspiration as well. And 66 years later, with an amazing legacy, we know exactly what is possible. We know that healing is possible. We know that recovery is possible. We know that empowering women and empowering families is possible. And we also know that in order to do this work, it takes donations from people like you. All of this work is only possible through you. So as my last official act of tonight, I am going to ask you all to open your wallets. And if you were in fact inspired by Tonier's story, or if you've been inspired by the story of Wayside, I'm gonna ask you to open up your wallets tonight and make a donation. I'm going to ask you to make a donation in honor the, of the hope of what is possible and the hope that the families that we are serving can have brighter futures than what they are experiencing today. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate all of you and have a great night.